have divided it into uh, basically two sections. Uh, the overall philosophy is that I'm going to go over certain architecture level features, which are available in Blue Yonder, which are often not really well known or well understood. And uh, because of that, we sometimes create complex uh, solutions. Uh, but when the, these features have been available for you know several years now, but uh, oftentimes they are not well understood and well architecture or, or well uh, uh, incorporated into the solutions. So I would just go over some of those concepts, what are available, and then I would go over some of the like they should be treated as more building blocks or Lego, and then we would use them and see how they can uh, make some of the problems much easier if we use them properly. So uh, the first one, which is often not really understood or it is, it is well understood, but not really exploited uh, to its uh, real potential. That is that the Mocha code itself can be data. So that is in within the solution used, that concept is used very extensively. We have concept of workflows, uh, integrations uh, rely on this concept quite heavily. So overall, this is uh, utilized within the solution quite a bit, but often this is not really utilized to its maximum potential when we are divine, designing extensions or uh, solutions to that problem. So idea basically is that any snippet of uh, Mocha code can be uh, dynamic as well. So which means that you can put code within a variable, so which means that could be read from a database table or something like that, and you could execute it. You could execute it in line, which means that it would be actually sensitive to the context that is available, or you could execute it without context. So both of those things are uh, available. And, uh, and the implementation is quite good. The performance, of course, you are going, every time we go to dynamic anything, there's a slight uh, performance penalty that we have to pay. But if it is done at the right level, uh, then uh, the performance penalty is quite low. So for example, over these 100,000 uh, executions, uh, it went from 0.32 to 1.01 seconds. So yes, it is a little bit of an overhead, but if it is done at a proper level, that would be negligible in most scenarios. So that is uh, a very important functionality that is available. And I will discuss later some of the use cases uh, which could be simplified by just understanding this uh, functionality that is available at the uh, Mocha level. And next one, which is uh, not very uh, well understood and used at all, uh, but has been there since 90s. So since the earliest versions of Mocha, this was available, which is that we can execute any code in parallel across multiple Mocha servers. So for example, uh, you know, as it is listed here, you just simply say uh, parallel or in parallel, one of those two uh basically uh, uh, uh syntax on the on the top then you give a list of uh very uh, servers that you're accessing and then whatever code is in the middle is going to be executed at the same time across all of them and then as it is uh, visible on the screen that then you can combine them together so it, uh, it handles everything all the complexity of parallel execution that mocha would handle it just fine it would wait for all the results to come on all that kind of good stuff and then present to you the results uh, in the final uh, record set. So as you can see that that opens up a host of possibilities and I would discuss some of them uh, later on, but that is something which is actually not utilized even with, within Blue Yonder's own solution uh, very well. So this is a, something which is very mature, has been around for a long time and uh, something which is for you guys to use when you want to use it. There are two types of parallel executions. One is in parallel and one is parallel. And the difference is that in parallel actually would even uh, take advantage of the uh, transaction. So it would actually make sure that the commits happen on all servers. If you are doing actually an update, it would have to do the commit in a two-phase commit fashion across the servers. Uh, parallel is something which is going to be out of transactions. So again, something which is very useful uh, and available for a long time in uh, Mocha. Another thing which has been available for a long time, and it is like, extremely useful, is the fact that any record set can be manipulated within Mocha using SQL, right? So it is, uh, so as uh, you can see the uh, screenshot uh, on the presentation right now, that you can have any arbitrary record set. However it is created is not important. 
that record set can then be piped to this select from internal table, uh, which is basically going to work on the record set. And then you can do anything which SQL allows. For example, you can do counts, you can do grouping, you can do any of those operations, sorting on that record set using this in, uh, implementation. So that again, opens up a host of possibilities because this is a very common thing that I have a record set and I want to do something to the record set. Again, just by using this uh, simple uh, syntax, we can do all of those operations quite easily. And the performance is actually very good with that. And as you can see that if I did a, <laughs> a simple uh, you know, do loop uh, uh, where I'm not going through that or I do the same thing with a select, the performance is very close to the same. Uh, so there is a slide, if the record sets became larger because it is it first adds it to an internal database in memory, so there's no disk uh, overhead. So it uh, puts it into internal memory first and then uh, executes on it. So there's a slight overhead as the record sets go larger, but for a uh, small record set, which in this case was a 10,000 record record set, uh, you know, you would not see much of a performance penalty and so on all advantages, but without much of a performance penalty in this case. Uh, then another one, which is, has been around for again, several years, is the fact that we can do asynchronous execution using Mocha. So which means that you can um, have, if you have a long running job, uh, you can have it run via asynchronous execution. So you can have several threads going on at the same time to work on the portion of the work. And it again, the API provided by Mocha is quite uh, elaborate and it would uh, take care of all the complexities of such a uh, endeavor. And it can all be done with local syntax and we're using Groovy. So again, something which is there to be utilized uh, 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 as we may see fit. Uh, another feature which is very useful is that of autonomous transactions. Again, that has that is quite mature. This is how, for example, when integrated transactions fail, uh, they end up writing data to a, a table in that situation. Uh, that is called an autonomous transaction. In Oracle also, we had something like with the Pragma Autonomous, we could do it all the time. But if since for, for several years now, this feature is natively available in Mocha. All you have to do is you have to say transaction new. And once you do that, then that particular command would run in its own commit context. So which means that you could have a main transaction which fails, which rolls back, but the sub transaction could have its own commit inside it. So that opens up again, a lot of possibilities. Many times we have scenarios where, uh, for example, in, we have used it in context of pick release logging that uh, you know, as soon as the file is printed, we want to log a daily trend, you know, knowing full well that the main transaction may eventually fail, but the, since the print actually happened, you know, that might be something where we want to log a daily trend in that situation. So again, opens up a host of possibilities. Many times we end up creating files to see the progress of something. But again, this would be a much better uh, solution as opposed to files that if you want to write something uh, from a long running job, you can just simply use this kind of a concept to write it to the tables instead. Uh, and that would basically uh, end up being a better solution and easily, more, much more maintainable. So that is something which is not uh, utilize but um, uh, mocha itself uh, like uh, the blue genre solution itself utilizes as i said for uh, logging transact logging errors from integrations another feature which is uh, again quite mature since the time when uh, groovy was introduced uh, this solution is there which basically says that the record set that is created can be created arbitrarily from within local syntax. So using Groovy, for example, we can create record set as we see, please. And then I would show later on how these concepts then come together uh, with the record set, internal tables and everything like that, which opens up a host of possibilities about what solutions we can create where much more easily rather than uh, over-engineered solutions. Because uh, as we know in Groovy, we can do anything we want. We could call other systems or we could call web services, anything we want. And we can take those results convert them as we see fit and make a record set as we want. And record set supports string, integer, date, double. It even supports record sets as uh, fields in a record set. So again, a very uh, useful functionality if we employ it at the uh, correct level. So we can create arbitrary record sets as we see fit. So uh, so as I described some of these basic tools, you know, there, there are many more such tools available in Mocha. And again, in the interest of time, I'm going to basically look at some, these, uh, some, uh, some of these and how these small Lego pieces can end up uh, simplifying our problems when we are faced with certain uh, solutions that we want to devise. If we just have these solutions in mind, how we can create 
much simpler solutions uh, by using these properly. So there are, this is a very common scenario that we, you know, blue yonder solution is only part of the game that we have uh, going on at the enterprise, right? So we have other systems, automation systems, ERP systems, all of them are uh, there. And then in many situations, we have multiple uh, blue yonder systems. So multiple blue yonder system is very common, for example, in the cloud scenario as well, but you may have that scenario in your enterprise where you have multiple blue yonder systems. And it is then a very common requirement to have some enterprise-wide use cases. For example, you want to uh, have an enterprise-wide inventory query. You know, you have multiple warehouses. What is my inventory across warehouses, for example? And we have these are actual solutions that we have actually built for some of our customers, that enterprise-wide inventory queries. Maybe you want to create a hold, which is across the enterprise. Uh, you want to have enterprise-wide master data, like you want to have a data, uh, like what is my part look on every warehouse uh, you can have enterprise-wide integration management so you can have a single console to see what are my integrations doing on the various instances so uh, again a host of possibilities in this uh, solution that open up so uh, and all what it needs under the hood is basically the concept of in parallel which i described earlier and in memory databases so again those two very nice building blocks make this all very easy to do. And I have seen where folks have created over-engineered solutions just to solve this problem. They would say, okay, since I need to have an enterprise view, maybe every time I am adjusting inventory, I need to send to a third system. Maybe I am, you know, all holes need to go through an integration flow and all that elaborate structure needs to be built. Actually, uh, Blue Yonder used to have a lens system, which was providing this capability and for that they had a lens system which was again an over-engineered system and would often uh, cause more uh, grief than a solution but again if the if your problem is simply to have those enterprise-wide use cases in parallel and memory in memory databases bring them all together in memory databases come in handy because maybe you want to query across the enterprise for your lot information but maybe you want to show in your screen summarized at the lot level across enterprises so all of those things and another thing is uh, which uh, makes it useful is that sometimes uh, because we have archiving as a fundamental uh, assumption in many solutions so sometimes you want to query your online system and archive system together and then multiply that by multiple systems so again something which is very uh, common requirement and if we utilize these features then the solution becomes very simple uh, to do in this kind of situation and then uh, next one is a further um, extension to the same idea that maybe you want to do heterogeneous uh, sources. So maybe, maybe you have several Mocha instances, but maybe you have a SAP, which is available either through an API, maybe you can call another system uh, via web service or something like that and get its data, or maybe that database is available uh, by a, you know, at the Oracle level or SQL Server level, you know, whatever the solution might be. So now the concepts that come together are, let's say you have to call a web service or an API of the system to get its data. So that would be arbitrary res result set that I discussed. You can call from Groovy, a web service to a third system, get its data, convert it to a record set. Then you can go to several uh, Mocha systems in parallel get those record sets. You can join them together because we know about the in memory databases. And now, rather than an over engineered solution where you are sending data left and right to uh, get to this view, all of this can be done within one uh, screen just by, you know, enter your input, hit find, and you would get your results across the enterprise in that situation. So, again, something which is very powerful, has been around for a long time, but not utilized. To its full potential often so this thing is going to provide much uh, simpler solution for those kind of a scenario so this uh, what i just described was something which brings together the concepts of uh, in parallel arbitrary result sets and uh, in memory databases so bringing those two three concepts together we can see that we can make very interesting solutions which would simplify uh, several use cases quite a bit <clears throat> and uh, this uh, rules engine is basically which we utilize quite a bit in our solutions this is something which is fundamental whenever we are doing uh, most projects because the requirements are uh, quite uh, you know common 
what we have is that uh, many times we have uh, to we have lookup tables to make decisions right we have for example if this these three conditions are true then you want to use this carrier etc cetera, etc cetera. you know this is a very common or in, in integrations we have field mappings that my inventory status is this and this needs to go as that those kind of problems are uh, very common then another very common requirement is that if this condition happens then you want to execute uh, this action so this is kind of like a workflow concept as well uh, or you could have monitors that you know when this condition happens you want to fix some data automatically so the, this is a very common uh, scenario uh, of having some sorts of rules engine but again something which uh, even though we have been using quite a bit uh, in our solutions but overall when we see the solution space uh, this is not utilized to its full potential and again a very mature functionality uh, ability to have uh, dynamic mocha has been around since the earliest versions uh, we can also use this for for example defaulting the fields in uh, wms etc all this requires is a full understanding of the fact that Mo that uh, we can have uh, mocha code as variable as well so for example what we do in almost all of our solutions is that we have a concept of map values right as i described that's a very common requirement that if my inventory status is this host sees that or you know if uh, you know or we might have default values for certain scenarios you know this is a very common requirement carrier matrix is something where uh, retri also has carrier matrix table and where it describes you know if the certain things are met then the uh, it needs to have uh, this specific carrier so in those kinds of situations what our solution is the screenshot that you can see is uh, something which we uh, have kind of common on all of our projects is that we describe the value that is going to be returned if this condition is true so rather than making a literal map like up through policy or something like that that if the status is there that this becomes the status we say that no we are not going to do that we are going to say that this value becomes the value if this condition is true so now what we have to do is simply make sure that all of the variables are available in context which is quite straightforward and then we just run through this rules engine and then uh, we get uh, our final solution quite easily blue yonder also provides a caching capability natively as well uh, which is another some uh, feature which is not utilized quite uh, heavily uh, and you know many times we are not using it to its full potential so now bringing all of those concepts together you can see that we don't pay performance penalty but actually our solution seems to actually is better in performance because we are bringing together caching concept as well so as you can see two approaches one is a very typical approach that uh, i want to look up a value so i just given an example that i'm doing a lookup against a policy but uh, that if the i would look up a value and idea is that i look up uh, get a map value for example so if i run that thousand times you know in this particular system i get 1.25 seconds uh, as response time versus if we simply went by a rules engine where all the rules are cached and everything like that our performance is much better actually because we are bringing together the concept of caching as well all of these rules are in memory so all we are doing is going through those rules and just figuring out what value uh, is what's going to be returned so it is uh, performance wise it's actually a better solution it's much easier to maintain and then we for example in one situation we replaced the standard carrier matrix that blue yonder has with a rules engine kind of a concept and while the carrier matrix had close to 2500 records to describe the various solutions uh, various scenarios uh, with this approach it went down to not even 100 records again like something which is because we can describe ands and or and all those kinds of expressions uh, overall yielding to a much more uh, you know robust solution then another place where we utilize this is that uh, uh, you know or, or if you are a 3pl or something like that you might have a lot of uh, uh, labels and reports uh, so what we utilize is that this concept is part of our framework for commands which are uh, used for the labels and reports as well so which means that uh, we have a single command and which we can extend using this concept as well as well to add extra columns uh, to those commands as well so again, again something which is again a lego piece which you can build in block what ends up being is that even though we might have 500 labels we would have a single command uh, which is the source of truth of the data for the labels which actually is is a real scenario right because many labels would be either being printed at the pick release time or at the inventory movement time so we have a single commands for that and then 
we utilize this concept to add extra columns to that as the needs evolve. So something which is very useful, performance is very good, and we, uh, we, we end up making the solution much simpler. Another flavor of the same thing is uh, like, if this, then do that kind of a scenario. You know, very common uh, problem that we have that uh, oftentimes we end up creating a host of triggers which require uh, more maintenance and stuff like that. So what we do is that at a various places in our code, we simply say, invoke the rules engine, right? That's all we say in our code. And now we are empowering our own development staff and also the advanced users that they can just go to the screen and they can uh, add records here as they see fit for a specific kind of scenario. So this ends up me meaning, you know, we, we, as I said, these are some of the mods which end all mods. So once you have done this now and you have created proper uh, triggering points where this, uh, you have code to invoke these rules engines, then all you are doing is when a specific scenario happens, you go to here and you add your condition and, and that's it. And all of the variables which make sense are available in the context. For example, you know, this, uh, uh, I have an example of carrier move created. So the carrier moves information would be on stack, warehouse would be on stack, client would be on stack. All of those are in, on stack. And you can then have uh, expression that if this expression is true, then you do this kind of actions. For example, we can use it for integrations. We can do it to print arbitrary reports. We can do it to maybe uh, call out other systems or uh, make some updates. So all of that becomes much uh, much easier in that uh, situation as well. And again, if you are bringing back together the concept of uh, uh, caching as well into this, then uh, performance is really not a concern in this uh, scenario. So this again is something which is very powerful and you know, one of those mods which ends all mods. <clears throat> uh, so application monitor is something which is part of almost every solution in some capacity. Uh, we have just abstracted that uh, problem a little bit. So because in, if you look at any live production system, you would have jobs to fix certain data, right? But what happens is that those jobs get a life of their own. You would have, you know, 50 jobs that nobody knows when they run and how often they run and all that kind of stuff. So what we always do, this is again something which we make part of all of our solutions, is that we create a single job, which we call it application monitor. And here we have abstracted all of these concepts now are coming together. Uh, so we, we say that we would have a command or a SQL or whatever, which detects a problem situation, right? So as I've seen, you know, you, uh, this is from an actual scenario where I have a detect uh, orphan in inventory moves, orphan pick moves, you know, some things which we see in the production system that has happened. And then what happens is that for every record of that is returned, you would have a fixed command. And what this does is that, uh, first of all, it is a single job, which is going to run every so often. And then it would log daily trends. Uh, and you, so you would have a nice record. They work consistently in this framework that whenever they run, they would do a daily trend. And then also we have a concept that uh, we can use it uh, to run less frequently. For example, there's a concept of second since last run. So if we run it only, let's say one hour uh, has passed, even though this job is running uh, every five minutes, uh, we can use it to send emails as well. So then when certain, some some situation happens, maybe you just want to send an email. So this becomes a, you know, a lifesaver in a production scenario there where, you know, certain situation happens, you know how to fix it, uh, but, uh, you know, then you don't know the root cause because it's, again, uh, system that we have installed which is somebody else's system so that scenario can always happen in any such system so what we can do is simply put logic to detect the condition and then logic to fix the condition and we would have all daily trends and everything that go along with it for auditing purposes and you know we have something which is very easy to uh, adjust for those kind of scenarios so again bringing together the concept of uh, dynamic uh, into that and we get a nice solution. Uh, another which is a, a thing which is very common where we would bring certain uh, concepts together is that we always have uh, long running jobs in any system, right? The pick release is a long running job. A long running means that it's, it's a job which takes certain time and it is running uh, frequently. A load and close is another uh, type of job like that. So what happens is a very common problem is that, uh, you know, did it run last time or did it not run last time? And the answer is in certain log files in the system, where you have to go to figure out if it ran. Then furthermore, if it's, you have a clustered environment, then it becomes even more of a problem. Uh, and then, uh, 
you you need to know consistently that where I am in the job, like if pick release ran, what what is it doing right now, or if load and close, what shipment it's on right now. So that is something which uh, again is a very common problem. So what the way we address is that uh, we have we we have a table called uh, OSSI job log, and we, and then we expose a simple API to register the job, register module or action within the job, like how far along it is within that and uh, uh, register the stop and start. So basically with that API and now it brings the concept of autonomous transactions in as well. So what it means is that uh, the job itself may roll back, but, because, uh, but we are doing this logging in its own commit context. So we know exactly what the job is doing at that specific time and uh, using the start and stop fields, we would know that if it has started or if it has not finished yet. So we would know exactly how far along a specific job is at as well. So for example, if load and close is running, we would know which shipment it's on, how many total shipments it was going to do, and, and all of those kinds of uh, things as well. So it's a, and we, we can see a historical view of data as well as a, uh, impl uh, like an indirect benefit of this. So we can see if, if our jobs are starting to take longer time, we have good data to show that. So this thing again becomes a lifesaver in many situations because we are logging that data and uh, we any jobs that we create would provide data consistently for those kinds of uh, situations. And so this asynchronous execution is something which uh, I described earlier is uh, again, this is, has been there for a long time. It is part of the main MOCA solution uh, as what I've described above as a, a screenshot is from MOCA's own documentation, which describes what this asynchronous execution is. So what we have done is abstracted it for our own API so that we can easily utilize it because asynchronous execution by definition is a complex uh, concept concept to implement. So what we do is that we have abstracted it to say that, okay, any asynchronous uh, execution requires that you would have a, you have to get work and then you have to work on every record that is returned. So that is how we have abstracted it. So we have this single uh, Mocha command which runs stuff via asynchronous execution using the solution that is uh, described above, all groovy local syntax uh, solution. So we create one command which gets us the work and one command which works on one of those. For example, one command would say all the shipments which are ready to load and close, and then one command to load and close one shipment. And then we simply run it via this, uh, uh, this command, which could be part of a job. So as you can see very easily, and it also brings together the concept of job log execution that I have described uh, in the previous slide. So all of those concepts coming together means that the person, the actual task of writing a new job was very easy. All I did was created a command for uh, getting the work and to do one of those work items. And then I simply run it through this. I tell it how many maximum threads to start uh, and that's it. So I say num current concurrent calls, I could say 20, which means that uh, after getting the work, it would start up to 20 threads to process all of them in parallel, and all of that would happen. Uh, and the solution is quite simple. And even on the back end, uh, Mocha provided very, you know, nice uh, framework to uh, execute asynchronous, uh, asynchronously. So all of those concepts come together very nicely, and we get a good solution at the end to do all the work in parallel. So, for example, load and close job with this way would become uh, much easier to handle versus now it runs in. Uh, sequence. Many uh, I've seen many places where they would create a something like a with a mod logic similar solution, but those are again much more complex solutions to this problem, and then you have to make it a one-off solution for every kind of scenario. So again, we, with this, uh, we use this quite heavily to for any time we have a long-running job, we always run this through asynchronous execution model so that we can uh, run them in parallel. So uh, again, the, the last brings together many concepts that we discussed at the MOCA level, and then uh, it, it, it comes up to a nice solution. This is one use case which we have seen quite often, so I would just describe how we view it. This is automatic wave planning. Right? This is a very common requirement we have implemented for several of our customers. The uh, requirement basically is that we want to plan waves automatically based on certain scenarios. So again, our philosophy, design philosophy always is that we try to not invent new concepts. So when we look at this problem, it is it looks very familiar if we look at the underlying functionality on all versions of Red Prairie, there was a concept of criteria on with several screens. And this screenshot is from the latest version where we have a similar concept that we can select a rule, then we can have filters that are created and then we provide 
input again so so we when this is we look at this requirement we look at it more abstractly that all we are saying is that we want to automatically run these rules filters rules criteria whatever that uh, version of redberry might be and then it would create our ways automatically and now we bring together the concepts of asynchronous execution and everything alongside of it a job log so that it works like a nice uh, package solution but overall uh, for example this works quite nicely that we simply have this job itself running every let's say five minutes and we have uh, you know we, we can indicate that particular rule which would point to a specific filter uh, it runs on these days these times within these times you know we can provide all those kind of filters and it would run plan our waves uh, and it could also do allocation and pick release of those waves if we so choose as you can see in the screenshot and a uh, you know very nice solution and it uh, makes the problem much easier for example if you're getting a lot of orders downloaded throughout the day this would automatically see those orders and plan into wave and allocate pick release do everything uh, but uh, what i am basically trying to emphasize is that in order to get there what was our approach right approach is to use the building blocks that are there solutions you use utilize those building blocks and not invent new concepts so again when the problem came we say that no it's not fundamentally a different problem it is looking at existing screens and just automating them and that should be our goal and approach to every uh, problem that we see is to not try to invent new fundamental concepts so uh, another very common use case for wms is uh, integrating with automation systems like uh, MHE systems, ASRS systems of ASTI, Tick to Light, all of those systems. It's a very common requirement. And uh, what I would describe is that how do we handle it? So our, again, first and fundamental approach to any time we are involved in a project is do not invent new concepts. We do not want to, uh, the Blue Yonder has been around for, in the WMS has been around for, you know, several decades now. and the concepts, the fundamental concepts are very nice and very uh, and very well placed. So they go very nicely into an automation system. So always we say, okay, if I'm automating something, I am automating an existing use case. So that fundamental statement brings things into perspective. If I'm doing a pick to light picking, well, I can do picking without pick to light as well. So what is it that I am automating? Right? Looking at it that way. If I'm doing ASRS, full palette or case level, whatever, what am I really automating? I'm automating an existing use case. So we do that first, very important, without a single line of code, without even looking at the integration specs of the other, other we always say, what are we really automating? Then we prototype a complete solution without automation, right? If we are doing OSR uh, or uh, ASRS or pick to light, like what are the areas we were talking about, where the inventory would be, how would the picking happen? And all of that is not even looking at the integration spec yet. Because integration itself is the easiest part. Oftentimes integration takes center stage. So the first time we are talking about uh, integration, unfortunately, the first meeting we would have is, hey, this is how we integrate which is supposed to be much later. First, we need to know at a higher level, what are we integrating? What use cases would it integrate? And how would the two systems come together conceptually? And then, you know, rest assured integration with Blue Yonder is uh, not never a problem, but it is these design concepts that need to be understood fully. So for example, in outbound scenarios, which would be the scenario of uh, pick to light and uh, ASRS systems, OSR systems, you know, again, several of those solutions, uh, we need to understand the overall flow of life of an outbound entity. So order gets downloaded, it's plans to a shipment where I discuss the automatic wave planning as well, but you know, that's where the shipment gets planned, the waves get allocated, and then pick release happens. So this is typically our friend. The pick release is where uh, most of the integration uh, should happen. Uh, so the pick release also, we need to understand what phases it goes through, it register, uh, the shipment is allocated, it cartonizes it, so we need to know that cartonization would happen as part of it in case we are interested in that. It would allocate the hop locations. Then the final pick release happens. And then the final pick release happens, that is where it creates work, right? And then we do picking and movement later on. What our approach is for all of these kind of solutions, whether it is OSR picking or whether it is pick to light picking, is that we go at the create work, right? So that is what we extend. We say create that, again looking at abstractly whether you are picking by a forklift or whether you're picking by hand or you're picking by 
MHE, they're all different types of operation codes. So that's what our level of abstraction is. So all we are saying is that when it is this type of picking, by the way, it is not going to be done by RF, it is going to be done by another system. So again, looking at that abstraction is very important. And the way we get that abstraction, then it means that uh, by look, getting a nice abstraction, what it means is that it looks very nicely. You could have load level picks and you could have the picks going to an ASRS in the single view uh, where they are. And then when that work gets completed or this works get completed, they all come together very easily and very nicely. And we also need to understand how list picks work. So again, my basic message is that look at the underlying concepts first. All of this discussion is what is more important versus how we integrate to that pick to light or whether to that ASRS system. And then uh, again, very important that when the picking happens, and oftentimes it has to go through movements. And those movements, are, again, picking itself should be standard, just like a, you pick from an RF, it causes move inventory. Similarly, this picking should be doing that. Uh, oftentimes, we I see that we go off tangent and say, oh, move inventory is going to be too slow. We don't want to go move inventory or all of those kinds of things which are not well founded. So again, we want to not invent new concepts. Again, fundamental uh, uh, statement should be that we are not going to invent new concepts. Whatever happens without automation is what's going to happen with automation, just automatically. And, and if we keep that in mind, then we get nice solutions which are simple to maintain and, and work much easily over time. So this is basically our one flow. Our approach is to go at the clear work, which opens up a whole host of possibilities. You get throttling capabilities, in build, for example, you can create work as locked and then you can unlock them. Then again, that is there. You can have priority concept, which is just there. So all of those concepts work nicely if we integrate at that level. So this is something which are very common in many of the solutions that we do. Uh, similarly, uh, when we, if you're talking about something like an ASRS or a system, then uh, inbound, uh, which means inventory into that system is also something which oftentimes needs to be uh, uh, automated again very important is to just understand wms concepts first that is again my message is to always understand wms concepts first and uh, forget about uh, integration details at that time so here there is a very fundamental concept which is available in BlackBerry uh, is that whenever we put into a location it can create work for the next onward uh, put away so again it works beautifully because you are trying to put it into ASRS, most likely you're going to put into an induction area anyways. And as soon as you put into induction area, it can create work. And as I described earlier, work is a very nice integration point to talk to other systems. And then all of it comes together nicely because we utilize the existing concept, which was that as soon as inventory is deposited into a location, it can create work automatically. That is a, a standard concept in Recreate Blue Yonder. So again, my message basically is that we should not be trying to uh, create new concepts and just uh, implement, the, implement them as needed. Uh, then, you know, last time I checked, we are in year 2021. So in this, we should be trying to avoid legacy integration methodologies, which are overly complex and don't provide, uh, you know, a good level of integration like sockets, are there they are there we can utilize them uh, or files so we should try to avoid them at all costs so we should uh, go to an api level integration so api level uh, so in um, uh, api level could be that you could have two flavors you know we could call the underlying mocha command directly from uh, based on an api or we could say that we want to have a little bit of a uh, indirection that uh, we would get an xml message and it would go to integration integrator and then it processed as a download from there. So both I would consider API level integration. But the idea being that the other system should be sending data in this methodology and not like a file or a socket based, uh, raw socket based communication. Uh, so in uh, 2019 onwards, we can create those uh, web services quite easily within Mocha. Or we have a solution as well, which is called Ugi, which provides a REST based uh, API framework, uh, or you can just send post XML to it and it would uh, basically act as a broker. So it would basically say, get, get the XML message or uh, web service request, and it would call onward the Mocha command or onto uh, the WMS as well. So this basically provides uh, a very nice, sim a simple front end for all the various systems. It can serve multiple instances of uh, uh, Red Prairie as well. From one instance of Moogi, it can talk to legacy versions as well, like 2009. Uh, 2005 all those versions as well 
So it has its own value, but in the newer versions of RedBerry 2019 onwards, you can create web services quite easily uh, within them as well. But the basic uh, idea is that if we are going to an integration problem in year 2021, this should be our default answer that we are going to do API level integration and not go to you know legacy concepts because most of them, uh, MHE vendors would already provide that kind of a capability. And this basically streamlines the solution a lot. Uh, another thing which is often left, you know, uh, we don't talk about it early on, is that emulation is should be considered like a fundamental requirement. Whenever we are doing any integration project with MHE equipment, we consider it as a requirement. Even if the customer did not know, then we have to educate them that hey, you know, emulation is not something which can be an afterthought. Hey, how do I uh, do it in a development environment when the MHE system is not available? Unfortunately, what I've seen is that even now when we talk to many, many MHE systems, uh, they don't have like a full solution suite available to just emulate the messages. Unfortunately, that we don't see quite often. So what we should do is simply uh, have that capability built in so that we should be able to do all use cases as if they are coming from MHE. Uh, so again, if since we if we we typically do it as a work queue, so we create a single screen like that called work queue integration for MHE. It shows all the work, and then we simply put uh, buttons on the bottom to say that hey, you know, I want to emulate. For example, if I did a pick, uh, pick create, pick request created, then I just press this button and it would uh, mimic as if the pick is completed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, idea being that emulation should be considered upfront as a fundamental requirement and make made part of the project so that in lower environment we can uh, do all the use cases uh, easily uh, otherwise it becomes quite a big of a challenge uh, later on uh, in production also it could come in handy for example if you are having troubleshooting scenarios but uh, basic utilization is in the lower environments uh, another very common uh, thing which we have done uh, over in several projects is uh, uh, parcel system integration that we used to have a, its own parcel system which we have they have now obsolete uh, and there are again but once we uh, go to the market there are several uh, opportunities available to use the various uh, uh, vendors that might be out there so we can choose what we like the most because integration is never a big problem with uh, Repre. for parcels uh, integration Repre has a very nice you know there's this create pm package remove pm package and produce pm package label are the basic commands which are going to handle everything and everything goes into the manifest table so again it comes brings everything together very nicely these are the apis which uh, you call to get the tracking number so within them you can now all the concepts come in together of uh, if you uh, want to go through an integrator then all you do is create an integrated transaction uh, synchronously do a slxml to http uh, communication method this communication method allows you to get the response and parse the response with the XML API and add to the manifest table uh, right away. So again, something which can come very easily. So I can create the package call, got called, it logged an integrated transaction, it posted an XML to another system, it got the response and it added to the manifest table all uh, in line uh, very easily. Uh, and we then open up the possibility of using any parcel system that we like and we don't uh, have to stick to the one which we which might which might not be solving our uh, specific problems so again something uh, fundamental thing that i want us to understand is that we don't want to invent new concepts see what is there and just tweak it slightly to fit our specific scenarios and needs so uh, uh, this is basically all i wanted to go over in, in this presentation uh, but the basic point of view was that you, you should all understand the architecture level capabilities very well because if we understand them very well then uh, the the solutions just bubble up uh, very easily for example this enterprise wide use case is a very common uh, requirement for which we often have over engineered solutions and data is going to this system to this database then from there we have you know it's overly uh, in your concept well in, well all along we can do a simple parallel queries or heterogeneous data sources and uh, just get it done uh, very quickly very easily and uh, with a better overall solution uh, all of those uh, and there are several more architecture level capabilities that are available in moca there to be exploited for our use cases 
uh, in memory databases again something which has helped me out quite a bit in solving integration problems especially you know how to bring them all together uh, rule based uh, uh, engine that rule rule engine that we have is uh, something which uh, simplifies our solutions uh, you know very well and the second thing is that uh, we must understand the core concepts of wms very well because without that then uh, if we go on a solution approach then we would always uh, come up with uh, you know below par solutions if you don't understand the wms concept because you might end up uh, creating a new concept or we uh, or we might end up uh, uh, you know breaking the abstraction that is there already so we always want to uh, understand the core concept and just tweak them uh, here and there uh, you know understanding full well that this system has is a tier 1 system it has been around for a long time so all the concepts are there we just need to figure out where they are and then and just tweak them nicely for our solution most of the solutions we do we have, we have done very complex uh, projects but we rarely if ever have to go down to c code or java code we can do everything with the tool sets that are available in local syntax and groovy and we are able to create uh, very elaborate solutions uh, by just focusing on what the capabilities are that are available at the architecture level and the uh, underlying wms concepts so that's basically it uh, at this time um, i would open up to q a uh, there was one question that came in about uh, you know if it was possible to uh, update the rf forms uh, so yes it is certainly uh, possible to update the rf forms uh, and in in that way we can do uh, any type of uh, gui form with the traditional uh, .NET based forms or uh, the new java uh, the, the new web based forms as well so everything can be customized uh, but you know i did not go over those concepts in this uh, specific uh, presentation but maybe we'll do a follow up on how how to go about it but yes uh, it is very straightforward and it's quite elegant as well because you can you don't have to have the source code uh, to modify an existing form so that is oftentimes something what uh, so if you have to mod, uh, in, extend the deposit form or a pickup form we can really just extend it uh, without having the source code uh, available for it uh, 